Real Life presents the Jack Hibbs Podcast, with intention and boldness to proclaim truth, equip the saints, and impact our culture. When it comes to the rapture and the second coming, there's a great difference. And a lot of people today are saying that there's no difference. Know the difference. Know the difference. You can get the outlines of this podcast by going to jackhibbs.com slash podcast. Today, if this podcast lifts you up and encourages you to live a more fulfilled life in Christ, then make sure you leave us one of those five-star ratings. To us, that's like saying amen or yes. Then that rating will encourage others to listen. Now open your hearts to what God's Word has to say to you. Here is Jack Hibbs. I love books, and I have some really old books. And so when I'm reading these great saints of yesteryear, I have books that are two, three, four, five hundred year old authors. When you read guys who, for example, great scholars 500 years ago, when they look at Jesus' words about the temple or when they look at Daniel chapter 9, you should hear what they have to say. It makes no sense. You want to know why? They were so far back that they didn't see clearly up ahead. Time is linear, people, on a line. Think of it. Time begins and time ends. And you know what's cool about this? We know that that's true even in physics. Time is a physical aspect of physics. You can tamper with time. It's weird. Time begins and time ends on a linear scale. And somewhere along the line, somebody lived and somebody wrote a book. And for their day, at their time, they had an understanding from their perspective Now, those of us who live in the 21st century are way further down on that timeline with Bible open. For example, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, mark it down, is the lock and key of understanding all Bible prophecy. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. If you don't read Daniel 9, 24 to 27, you'll never understand the book of Revelation. Ain't no way. Listen. It's from, that, it's from those few verses of that book that it announces to us that Israel will come back into their own land. Israel will someday in the last days have a temple again. That the Messiah will come, but he's going to be killed, but not because he did anything wrong. It tells us that another one will come after they reject him and they will accept an imposter. It's Daniel 9, 24 to 27 that tells us in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, he breaks the treaty he makes with Israel. That's Old Testament doctrine, people. We understand that now because Israel is a nation again. The wheels are turning. And we're further down on that linear scale now toward the end. And it's an amazing time to be alive church family. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says this. Daniel 12, 4, listen to this, says, but you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Watch this, scholars, because here comes a qualifying statement. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Translation, Daniel. What I just showed you, just lock it up. Just lock it up. You're not going to get it. People are not going to understand it. People won't be able to figure it out until we get closer to the end. Oh, by the way, Daniel, here's one of the clues, by the way, for people who will wind up reading this in the end. In English, it says men will travel to and fro. The Hebrew word is men will travel quickly and broadly, fast and far. Wow. And knowledge shall be increased. Exponential. Knowledge here, then here, then here. And it's really cool because the more time goes by, the greater the doubling up of knowledge gets. Where'd you get that idea from? Bible. Remarkable. Greater understanding as we get further down the road. Who would have, for example, who would have ever thought that it'd be a good idea to zero out all the global economies and currencies and make it just one numerical system and make it cashless? Human trafficking is a problem. What are we going to do about that? How do we stop drug and how do all the, how, what do we do? Remove, remove currencies. And you'll end it all. It's brilliant. The Bible tells us that's how a false messiah is going to come on the scene and deceive the world. Now we hear talk 
In fact, I was talking to my uh, Israeli friends just this last week, and Israel is considering now, nobody, they're considering it. Maybe now no one coming to Israel without having an Israeli vaccination because they trust theirs and they don't trust ours. I get it. Listen, what if the whole world says, yeah, that's right, you can't come to Canada without a vaccine. And then Australia says, yeah, you can't come down under either. Well, what if the whole world says, you can't come up? Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the mark of the beast. That's preparing people for it. Right. Do you understand? Because there could be five other things that come down the road before that time ever comes. I'm getting down a road that we shouldn't go down right now. <laughs> we have clear understanding. Number five, darkness. I'm talking about the moral decay and decadence and evil that is rampant in our world today. See, yeah, it's always been bad. Listen, not only has it not been this bad, I equate the times that we're living in, it sounds like they're almost similar to or equal with as it was in the days of Noah. Aberrant sexuality, violence. The Bible says there was violence continually. Remember, Jesus said it's going to get worse as we approach those times Increasing darkness. I'm sorry to pain you on this beautiful morning, but we won't be here long on this. I am dumbfounded, stupefied of this world's unwillingness to address evil. You, you pick the topic, and those that are supposed to be gatekeepers of truth turn a blind eye. If it's dialing 911 to the Supreme Court to a parent, turn a blind eye. Shocking. Increasing darkness where there's this absolute unified determination to suppress good. The things that, listen. The things that we're fighting, just this church, we're just a little nothing. We're not even a blip on the radar. You think about it. The things that we have to fight to keep our messages online these days now. The enemy is the social media czars. Why? Because when you don't have a real message of your own, you're terrified by truth. John Adams said, truth or facts are stubborn things. And when you can't cope with facts, you have to make things up. And listen... Please, I hope all of you learned this last week and a half. Well, I'm going to fact check that. <laughs> now we know who owns the fact checking apps. <laughs> Hello? Now, oh, Franklin Graham prays a prayer. And the fact checkers said, we fact checked his prayer. It's not correct. That's not what God meant when he said that. Can you believe this? Listen. You don't know what's true unless it's in the Bible. And I t if you can get a good book by a dead guy, then read it. Because if it's a good book by a living guy, I'm a little bit nervous because he's still alive. He could change his mind. <laughs> the Bible's not changing. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, What sorrow awaits those who say that evil is good and good is evil? That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow awaits those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever? Approaching is the greater hope. Church family, Titus 2.13, a verse I often quote because it's one of my life verses. It's undeniable. It says, looking for the blessed hope. The word looking here is in the active present. It means that we are, as believers, we are to be doing our jobs, living our lives, being who we are, doing what God has called us to do, and the whole time we're doing it, we are looking for the blessed hope. What does that mean? We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, says the Bible. Wow. Any time now, any moment now, any moment. Any time. Because remember, he can come for us at any time. So we're going to run through some things. Hang on. In the doctrine of 
eschatology within the study of theology. People who are lazy, I believe, in my opinion, lazy and pre-formulated by others can approach the Bible with a bias. And you can come out saying that this is how I view it rather than letting the Bible speak to you. Just let it talk to you. You must understand, church, that God calls the bride of Christ, the church in the Bible, a mystery. He never says that Israel is a mystery. Did you know that? He calls Israel his people, his nation. Are you with me? The Bible draws a clear distinction between the church, which is predominantly Gentile, and Israel. There is no national judgment or anything like that regarding the church. There's only, only individual judgment for the church or uh, scrutiny of Christ. But there is national judgment for the nation of Israel. This is important to know because when it comes to the rapture and the second coming, there's a great difference. And a lot of people today are saying that there's no difference. And frankly, that comes from lazy theology. So we can't fix the world in five minutes, but we're going to try. Are you ready? Get ready. Know the difference. Know the difference. Number one, let's look at this on the screen. The greater hope is this. So A will equal church, B will equal Israel. Number one, number one A. At the rapture, Jesus appears in the atmosphere to receive his church only. In the second coming, Jesus returns to Israel with his church. These are lifted right from passages of scripture. Number two. At the rapture, all church-age believers go up to meet Christ. At the second coming, all church-age believers come down with Christ. Number three. At the rapture, Christians are taken to the Father's house, Jesus said. At the second coming, Christians return from the Father's house, Revelation 19. Number four. At the rapture, there is no judgment on earth. At the second coming, Christ comes to judge all the nations of the earth. Number five. At the rapture, only the church sees and hears Christ appearing. At the second coming, unbelievers will see and hear Christ returning. Number six. At the rapture, the timing is imminent and sudden. At the second coming, the timing is chronological and sequential. Seven. At the rapture, there are no prerequisite events or signs required. At the second coming, multiple prerequisites and signs are required. Eight, at the rapture, the church is the focal point. At the second coming, Israel is the focal point. Nine, at the rapture, there is great joy and comfort. At the second coming, there is great weeping and sorrow. Ten, at the rapture, all believers are suddenly changed. At the second coming, no believers are suddenly changed. 11, at the rapture, there is no mention of Satan being bound. At the second coming, Satan is bound for a thousand years, and all God's people said, Amen. 13, oh, 12. <laughs> at the rapture, God's promise to deliver the church from uh, his wrath is fulfilled. At the second coming, God's promised wrath is fulfilled. 13. The church is taken up to heaven in the rapture and, and judged at the Bema seat. That's the Olympic seat, a gold, silver, bronze in heaven. That's the word Bema. That's where it comes from, from the Olympics of the of, uh, first century. At the second coming, all nations are judged at Jerusalem. The Bible says it has to happen in Jerusalem, according to the book of Joel and Zechariah. No, uh, number 14, at the rapture, the seven-year tribulation period begins. At the second coming, the seven-year tribulation period ends. Fifteen, at the rapture, there is no marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven. At the second coming, there is marriage uh, feast of the Lamb on earth. That is debated by some scholars. I commend you to Dr. John Wolvert on that. It's an amazing study. What's the point? The point is that there's a difference. This is the first time, listen, are you sitting down? This is huge, what I'm about to say. Since 1948, this is the first time the church and Israel has coexisted for the first time in history. That's how close we are. Because God is just about ready to put his eyes back on Israel. That's a remarkable thing. 
And listen, we do end with this. Approaching is the one matter or the, one, the, the most important matter of our time today. This is what matters. And it is this. That as God looks upon time, the scriptures tell us that whenever we hear the gospel, we are now responsible for it. No matter what I've said prior to this moment, this now becomes the most important thing and the most important thing said. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, according to the Old Testament scriptures, came, born of a virgin, died on a cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead and left an empty tomb in Jerusalem. Having been resurrected from the dead by his sacrifice, by his offering, his pass over, our sins are forgiven. And the Bible says, Jesus Christ said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but through man. He's the only way. This is the most important thing. That you cannot save yourself. You cannot be good enough. The moment you find out how amazing God is, you realize how wretched you are. That's why God gave us the Ten Commandments, because they're perfect and holy and pure. And when we wake up to the value of them, we realize we broke the first one. (laughs) Well, how many do you need to break before you... Look, poor Moses. Moses comes down the mountain. (laughs) Moses is carrying the Ten Commandments down the mountain. And poor Joshua, he's standing there waiting. Can you imagine? Looks in the sundial. It's been forever. (laughs) Moses comes down and Joshua says, listen, the people are rejoicing. Moses says, they're not rejoicing. They're having an orgy. And Moses throws down the Ten Commandments and then tells them, you people broke these. Think about it. They did. They were breaking it before God probably put his finger in the stone. And it's true for all of us. We wake up to the realization that we're sick. We find out we have cancer. We find out that we've got leukemia. We find out that we've got a problem. After we have it. God's word says... All of us are S-I-N positive. (laughs) And he says, but I took care of that. If you come to me, I will remove your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. The most important thing of these last days, and church, I'm going to leave this with you. It's for us to give people the gospel. Listen, people are mortified. People are terrified right now. You you hear what's going on in Texas? The governor opened up the state of Texas. So watch this. And a bunch of other governors followed followed his lead. Here's the deal. Did you see? uh, The governor's going to be sued, and so is the state of Texas. By Texans. I'm going to get mail for this. I shouldn't have called them Texans. They're probably a bunch of Californians who moved to Texas. (laughs) (laughs) we're sorry sorry but they're suing they're they're going to sue the governor or they're threatening to sue the governor because uh, they don't want to stop wearing masks look first of all it's a free country you want to wear a mask wear a mask no, no, listen, it's okay. Listen, here's the deal. I'm going somewhere with this. Mask, no mask, I don't care. Listen, here's the thing. Even when it's okay to not wear a mask, people want to wear a mask. Why? But why do they want to wear a mask? Because they're, they're fearful. They're scared. I don't want to get it. Listen, this, this is your assignment this week. Every one of us when you go out into the world, look, if, if you should wear a mask, wear a mask. Amen. I'm dead serious. But here's the thing. When you see someone, remember, you're supposed to answer their questions with respect and kindness. You can go up to somebody and say, I see you're wearing a mask. Are you okay? How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Listen, I know that a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are fearful, and fear has clearly crippled families and our culture. Listen, friend, I want to pray for you, but I want you to know something. I'm a Christian. I'll just confess that straight up. I'm a Christian, 
And I was at church last Sunday and the pastor said something about a person wears a mask so that they don't get sick. That they believe that the mask is gonna stop the virus. And so here's the thing, Jesus Christ, he came to stop the virus of sin in our lives. Jesus hung on the cross to die for our sins and then being resurrected to impart his righteousness to us. That, friend, I understand the fear part of it, but the greater fear is where are you gonna go if you die? Where are you going? Listen, you shouldn't be so afraid of being sick here. Your great fear should be sick in eternity. Jesus said, I am the physician. I have come to heal those that are sick. This Jack Hibbs podcast, as well as all the broadcast outreach opportunities, are listener supported. Will you consider partnering with us through a special gift? Go to jackhibbs.com to learn more and stay connected. Free.